Another way that we can explain this is that God's gospel for us is not primarily behavioral. The gospel is primarily ontological. Ontological. Ontos is the Greek word for being. What this means is that God remakes our being. He is remaking and refashioning a new humanity, sacramentally united with his Son, filled with the Spirit, the breath of God. We are a people, as the church, that have had the breath of God sighed out over us, and God's word over his church is ephatha, be opened. This is the contrast that St. Paul is making in his epistle. Who can deny that the old covenant had glory? As I made the point, Moses' face was shining so bright that the Israelites had to turn away. That was the glory of the old covenant, which Paul says is the ministration of condemnation. That's the glory that was proper to that. But the Old Covenant stopped at the behavioral. It did not redeem our being. It was not ontological. It didn't fix what was really going on. This is why Paul calls it a ministry of condemnation. So if that covenant was glorious, how much more is the new covenant which is actually fixing our problem. How much more is that glory that is in us? So where do we go with such amazing news? Again, we must respond with faith. Now this is harder than you might expect. This ministration of glory that is in us, do you sense that in your day-to-day -day life, mothers? Do you see the shining of Moses' face when you discipline and train your children every day? It doesn't shine like Moses' face. It doesn't look or feel the same as when the, men, as when the Israelites had to turn away. We don't always feel the experience of the gospel as more glorious. Those of you who are aging, do you feel that, you're, that you've been made whole ontologically? We still feel the effects. We pray for faith. Jesus in this story actually wanted to hide something that was going to be manifest way in the future. But he was also manifesting something for this man that was going to be hidden for a long time, even today. He was making clear that he does possess the power to heal our entire being, though we cannot see it very often. For the vast majority of Christians, Jesus does not actually spit and touch our tongues. But he does inspire our voices to sing today. He does not, for most people, stick his fingers in their ears. But he is moving mysteriously, even in this room, that you would hear the message that God has for you right now. He only washed a few disciples' feet, and yet he continues to serve his people through his people. When we give our spouse a glass of water in the night, or we encourage a fellow parishioner. We drop off a meal for someone who's sick. Or we volunteer to serve the needy. There is a glory that is planted in us. It is germinated through the tears of contrition and the light of God's word. We, don't, we do not know what this will be in the resurrection. But faith is the, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things that are not yet seen. So our first response to the good news of this glorious gospel is faith. 
And the second is to trust. We must trust that God is in control. We must take the people of Galilee at their word that he does all things very well. When we trust God that he will do what he says he will, this is almost indistinguishable from faith. But there is another aspect of trust that we can find in our epistle today. Our epistles from 2 Corinthians. And in 2 Corinthians, St. Paul is defending his ministry. There are impressive preachers that are trash-talking Paul behind his back. They say that he is weak in his speaking, but harsh in his letters. And they, on the other hand, are kind and powerful from the pulpit. Paul in his epistle is making the point that Christians are free from the need to compare themselves with one another. We can accept the unimpressiveness of ourselves and of others because we know that behind the veil of our fallen humanity, hidden from the world, is a blazing fire of the living God pulsing through every vein, throbbing in our mind, refashioning us mightily yet imperceptibly, gloriously yet hidden. So to foist ourselves around or to wallow in self-criticism is to ignore the reality that actually binds us together. Our communion with God is not based on anything but his action towards us. And our communion with one another is not based on anything but God's action towards us. Our identity is not where we are in the journey, but it's where God is taking us. And it's not based on anything that we do. It's based on what God is making us. Our sufficiency, Paul says, is in God. These five words are worthy of our deepest contemplation this week. If this truth were to sink deeply into our souls, what might it purge? I bet it would surprise us. Would it change the way that we talked with people? Would, it, would we be as quick to be silly or to joke coarsely? Our affirmation is from God. Would it change the way that we related to others? You can see in the epistle that Paul is not threatened by these super apostles, as he calls them, because he does not compare himself with others. His sufficiency is in what God is doing in his heart. That's the glory that upholds his identity. It would change everything that we do if we truly believe that God is our sufficiency. It would change the way we did the dishes, as we see in Brother Lawrence. Because any action done or word spoken that does not have its energy and sufficiency in God is an action done apart from God which corrupts the soul and makes it pitiful. But living in that sufficiency makes us trusting, humble, peaceful, meek, happy, others-focused, servant-hearted, hopeful, sincere. Paul knew this well. So did the man whose ears were opened and his tongue loosed. Beloved, let us be a people who hold fast to the hope that God is working in us mightily but imperceptibly. And let us be a people who trust in that work for our sufficiency. Amen.